I want to uh, speak to you tonight on the presence of God. We uh, came into the prayer meeting tonight and I was uh, sitting there and Brother Bernie, Bertie rather, began to uh, pray and the very first thing out of his mouth was, uh, Lord, we need your presence. And if there is one thing that I desire above everything else, it is the presence of God. My wife and I had the privilege of raising our children in the city of Christchurch, New Zealand. For those of you who know anything about New Zealand, Christchurch is the largest city in the South Island, uh, that very beautiful country, a city of about 350,000 people. And uh, up until recently, before the earthquake, the center of the city was an old Anglican or Episcopal cathedral, beautiful old building that has now been destroyed because of the earthquake two years ago. But just a short distance away from that uh, cathedral, there is a museum. It's called the Canterbury Museum. It's an old building dating back to the 1800s, covered in ivory part of it. And as you go through the main entranceway, there is a verse of scripture right across the entranceway. And it uh, has these words inscribed on it from the book of Job, Job chapter 26 and verse 14. Lo, these are a part of his ways but how little portion do we hear of him? Let me say that again. Lo, these are a part of his ways, but how little a portion do we hear of him? I have spent many, many hours in that museum when our children were young, along with Nancy walking down the various corridors, looking at all the display cabinets, admiring all of God's creation, birds and butterflies and reptiles and all sorts of animals, monkeys, uh, you know, every conceivable animal from around the world all sort of mounted there in their sort of natural habitat. I've opened uh, drawers and looked at birds' nests and, uh, you know, bugs from around the world. I've seen children grab the hand of a parent and point to some animal or reptile and say, where does that come from or what is that? And yet in all the hours that I've spent in that museum, I don't ever remember anybody attributing all of that handiwork to God himself. And so that verse is a fitting verse, though these are a part of his ways. But how little portion is heard of him. And while that may be a good verse to put over the museum, it is a tragic verse to put over the house of God. And yet in America, and I'm not uh, that familiar with your country anymore, but in America we have divided up the body of Christ into various segments, if you like. Many years ago, my father, when he was alive, sent me a book by Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. The book was on the Sermon on the Mount. And in the introduction, I believe it was, that he makes a statement, I have told Bible school students, is worth one semester in any Bible school. The statement he makes is this, there is nothing so likely to lead to error or to heresy as to focus on the parts rather than the whole. There's nothing so likely to lead to error or heresy as to focus or major on the parts rather than the whole. One of the things, again, we have done in America, we have majored on the parts. We have entire movements built around parts. We have an entire movement built around faith, the faith movement. We've got an entire movement built around prosperity, an entire movement built around signs and wonders an entire movement built around holiness, an entire movement built around something else. And while there is nothing wrong with any of those things in and of themselves, the error comes when we major on just one thing rather than the whole. And if you put all those parts together, you have a person. His name is the Lord Jesus Christ. And as I have studied the lives of great men and women of God over the years, and not only in the various books that have been written, but in God's Word, as I've looked at uh, men that God used, they all have one common denominator, and that is they all had an insatiable longing for the presence of God. Paul said that I may know Him. Not about Him. Paul knew about Him. He's still sort of confounding the scholars as to what he really believed or what he meant when he wrote certain things, but Paul did not say, I know what I believe. He obviously did, but he says, I know in whom I have believed. Writing to the Corinthians, he says, he has brought us into the fellowship of his son. 
And to Paul, it was all about Jesus. Even at the end of his life, after being caught up to the third heaven, seeing all sorts of things that were unlawful for him to tell us about, he still has that one deep cry that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. And that was the one thing that Paul longed for more than anybody else. And that should be the cry of every believer, should be the longing of every one of us, because we will never fully grasp and comprehend the magnitude, the greatness of God. Whether we live a thousand years or a million years, we'll still, you know, never grasp the unbelievable resources and the richness of the nature and the character of the one who made the heavens and the earth. Jeremiah says, if you boast about anything, don't boast about your bank account. I'm paraphrasing. Don't boast about your riches. Don't boast about your strength. Don't boast about your mind, your intellect. He says, if you boast in anything, boast in this, that you know and you understand me, said the Lord. Only one thing worth boasting about, your intimacy with God, your knowledge of God, how well you know Him, not about Him. Oh, we can have all our doctrines down pat. We can memorize books on doctrine and theology and still not know him. David, of course, was one of those individuals that uh, longed for God's presence. A day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord than dwell in the tents of wickedness. Just a day in your courts. Well, another place, he says, who have I in heaven but thee? And there is nothing on earth I desire beside thee. You know, I think that's one of the most difficult verses in the Bible. Oh, the first part of the verse is easy. Who have I in heaven but thee? My father's there, my mother's there, a few friends, relatives, and so on. The second part of the verse is the challenging part. There is nothing on earth I desire beside thee. When every time you turn on the television, every time you look at a billboard, it screams at you, unless you're driving this sort of car, unless you're wearing these sort of clothes, unless you've got, you know, this sort of uh, kitchen in your house, unless you're, you know, you'll never ever be satisfied. And David was able to overlook all of that, all the appeal of the world. He was a king. He could have had anything he wanted. And yet he came to this conclusion, there is nothing on earth that I desire apart from you, Lord. It's quite a statement. I don't know if I'm there yet. I'm getting there. I'm closer than I was a year ago or two years ago. I know that. Because really nothing satisfies but Jesus. Isn't that right? Oh, and I know we can sing it and we can say it, but is it really true? To David it was true. One thing he says, have I desired of the Lord, and that will I seek after. That I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Why? Just simply to behold the beauty of the Lord. And David loved to sort of just bask in the presence of God, just as one would lay out in the sun and feel the healing rays penetrate their body. And David was one that just used to love to get into the presence of God and feel, again, the wonderful presence of Almighty God. Another place, he says, is the deer pants for the water brook. So longs my soul after thee, O Lord. I did a... Uh, a conference many years ago up in a place in the top of the United States, up in uh, Washington State, a place called Moses Lake. The other minister that week we were sharing together, he mentioned that verse in a way that I had not thought of it before. He said, the only reason the deer is panting is because the deer is being chased, it's being pursued. In fact, one of the old covenant hymns puts it that way. And he said, the, the deer knows, or the, yeah, the deer knows, he said, instinctively, that there is only one place of protection, and that is to find its way into the water brook. Because there in the water brook, the predator that is chasing and pursuing that deer cannot pick up the scent, because in the water brook, the scent is lost. And so he says that the deer knows, if I can only find my way into the water brook, I can lose and no longer fear the predator. But he says not only that, he says the water brook is not only a place of protection, but the water brook is a place of satisfaction. Because there in the water brook, it can replenish that tired and weary and exhausted body. And he said, I believe David wrote that when he was being pursued by Saul. And David is fleeing from place to place, never knowing when the king is going to catch up with him, when his life is going to come to an end. 
And yet he knew, if I could only find my way into the presence of God. There under the shadow of the Almighty, I am protected. But not only that, but the river of God is full of water. If I can find my way into the presence of God, not only is it a place of protection, it's a place of satisfaction. Because there I can restore, again, my weary, tired, discouraged body by being in the presence of the Almighty and drinking in, again, the water of life. That was David's longing. Lord, just to know you. Just to know you. If you have your Bible, turn with me to the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 33, or chapter 32, first of all. And I want to look at another man, a man that we are familiar with, a man by the name of Moses. And as we come to this chapter, Moses is already in the presence of God. He has been summoned by God, asked by God to come up into the mountain. Of course, the weeks have gone by. The children of Israel are restless. They do not know what has taken place up there on the mountain. They are convinced that Moses is dead, maybe fallen down a crevice or something. And so they go to Aaron, Moses' brother, and they put pressure on him and say, listen, we need a God that will go before us. Moses is gone. We don't have the leadership that we want. And of course, Aaron bows to the pressure. <coughs> He gathers together the jewelry from the ladies, he throws it into the fire, and out pops the golden calf. At least that was his explanation. It's amazing, isn't it, what comes out of our mouth when we're sort of backed into a corner? But they fashion the golden calf. And around that golden calf is nothing less than a sexual orgy. People had stripped themselves naked. We need to understand that the gods in those days, as they still are in many countries, were fertility gods. And of course, the reason that they believed there was the increase and the multiplying of their crops and so on was through some means of sexual uh, intercourse. And so much of their worship of these gods, were, it was sensual in its nature. And here the children of Israel again have abandoned themselves, given way to every, every uh, fleshly desire and impulse. And they're dancing around this golden calf and God sees what's going on and God is angry. One of the angriest you ever see God in the Word of God. And he says to Moses, Moses, get down the mountain quickly. There in verse 7, And the Lord said to Moses, Go down, or get thee down, for thy people, which thou hast brought out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. It's amazing, isn't it, how quickly somebody can turn? After all, this is a nation just born again of the Spirit of God, basically. It's only a matter of... Uh, few months, if you like, prior to this, that they have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. They've come out of Egypt. They've seen all the signs and wonders and miracles. They've seen the Egyptians drowned and the plague after plague, the Nile turned to blood, all these amazing things that took place. And yet how quickly they've turned aside from the living God to a God that they've made with their own hands. And so Moses is sent down the mountain. And in verse 10, it says, Now therefore let me alone, that my wrath may wax hot against them, and that I may consume them, and I will make of you a great nation. I don't know if you've ever pondered that particular verse. It tells us at least something of the humility of this man Moses. He has been offered by God now. God is so angry. He says, I'm going to begin all over again. I'm going to wipe out the entire nation. And Moses, I will make of you a great nation. In other words, this nation will no longer be known as the nation of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This nation will now be known as the nation of Moses. I will make of you. In other words, I will replace Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as the founders of that nation. That nation will be gone, destroyed. And I will raise up from your loins, Abraham, I mean uh, Moses, I will raise up a new nation. It will be your nation. You will be the head of that nation. You will go down in history, Moses, as the leader of this new nation. In other words, you will have incredible fame, and Moses turns it down. I wonder how many of us could do that. Oh, God says to you, listen, Ravenhill, I will make of you a great nation. Birdie, I will make of you a great nation. Such was Moses. He is a shepherd, and he begins to pray. 
Verse 13, remember, he says, he reminds God, remember Abraham and Isaac and Israel, thy servants to whom thou didst swear by thine own self. And you said to them, I will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven, and all this land that I've spoken I will give to you and your seed, and they shall inherit it forever. You see, what Moses is doing here, he is bringing God and reminding God of his covenants. Imagine if you, can, if you like that uh, what he's really doing, if we were to put it in today's sort of a terminology, he's holding up a contract and he says, listen God, this is a contract that you made with Abraham. This is another contract you made with Isaac. This is another contract you made with Jacob and your name is right here. You signed a covenant. You made a contract. You cannot renege. You cannot revoke. God, you're the God that says you've exalted your word above your very name. You said heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will not pass away. God, you cannot do what you said you're going to do. If you break your covenant, we will never trust you again. We will never know if you're going to tell the truth or if you do tell the truth that you'll revoke it. We'll never know if those promises will stand. God, you said, let the, everything be yea and amen in Christ. All the promises are yea and amen in Christ. And you're talking about reneging. You're talking about destroying these covenants, these contracts that we have. You're backing down. Your name is here. Your nature is at stake. That's what he's doing in prayer. And God says, you got me. Notice the next verse, and the Lord repented of the evil that he said he would do to his people. So on the basis of covenant, Moses wins out. God, you cannot do what you said you're going to do. Otherwise, we'll never trust you again. Your word is no longer reliable because you make a promise and then you change the next day. God says, okay. And so on the basis again of covenant, Moses reminds God. Now we go to chapter 33 and it is now God's turn to remind Moses that he is a covenant-keeping God. Chapter 32, it's man reminding God. Now it's God reminding man. Verse 1, And the Lord said to Moses, Depart, and go up, for, uh, go up hence, thou and the people that thou hast brought up from the land of Egypt unto the land which I swore to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, saying unto thy seed, I will give it. And I'll send an angel before you. And I'll drive out the Canaanite, and the Amorite, and the Hittite, and the Perizzite, and the Hivite, and the Jebusite. Go up to a land that flows with milk and honey. Now, I can imagine as the news began to spread around the camp of Israel, they didn't have emails in those days, they didn't have their Twitter accounts and so on, but somehow I'm sure the news began to spread. Moses has got the word. We're going in. We're going in to possess the land. This is the thing that kept the children of Israel going for all those years of bondage and servitude in Egypt was the promise that one day we will be free. One day we will have our own houses and lands and vineyards. Let me just uh, take you to Deuteronomy chapter 6, <clears throat> verse 10. And it shall be when the Lord your God shall have brought thee into the land which he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you great and godly or goodly rather cities which thou buildest not, and houses full of good things which thou fillest not, and wells digged which thou diggest not, vineyards and olive trees which thou plantest not. In other words, that was the thing that kept the children of Israel going, was the promise that one day we will be out of the house of bondage, no longer in the house of servitude, no longer under the oppressive rule of the Egyptians, but we will be free, not only free, but God says you will have houses and lands and vineyards and olive trees, all of those things, beautiful houses. God says houses full of all good things. And he said, great and splendid cities, and then he puts a very important PS at the end, which thou buildest not. Whew. Why was that important? Because their entire life was spent building cities. That's all they did. City after city after city, they built the great big cities for Pharaoh. From the moment that they were born, virtually they were carrying the brick load. In fact, Psalm 81 and verse 6, it says, when God begins to recount what happened in Egypt, he says, uh, I removed your shoulder from the burden. 
And in the margin of my Bible, it says, I removed your shoulder from the brick load. You see, this was a nation stooped over from the youngest that could carry bricks to the oldest. They were a nation that day after day staggered under the weight of the brick load. And God says, he's my glory and the lifter of my head. He's taken off that burden, that weight. And you don't have to build another city because God is no man's debtor. And he says, all those cities that you built, I will repay you. And I will give you great cities, splendid cities, beautiful houses full of good things which you didn't have to build and you didn't have to fill. You know, I sometimes think that some of the promises in the old covenant are far greater than the promises of the new. Now, I've been to Bible school. I know the whole book of Hebrews is about better, 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 you know, better priesthood, better promises. But, you know, you, you can't beat some of these promises. I mean, imagine, let's say I'm Moses, just for example, and you're the children of Israel, and we get this news. And uh, let's modernize it, and uh, the promised land is, let's say, some uh, part of uh, Belfast, where all the homes are a million dollars plus, you know, some sort of gated community with a golf course, and that's the promised land. And God says to me, David, I want you to lead my people in. And we go into that particular promised land with all these magnificent homes full of good things, and we say, it's yours. Pick out whatever you want. And you can hardly believe it. You say, but I can't afford it. You don't have to afford it. No mortgages. Whatever house you want. And I say to my wife, which one do you like? And she said, you know, I like the Tudor style. And I said, yeah, but that's two stories. I like the uh, bungalow style because we're getting old. I don't want to climb upstairs. And she said, well, yeah, but this one's got a tennis court. I said, yeah, this one's got a swimming pool. And she said, yeah, but, you know, this one has got a couple of BMWs in the driveway. I said, well, that one's got a Rolls Royce, you know. And I said, well, you decide. And she said, well, we'll take this one. And we knock on the door, and we say, listen, I'm one of the God's kids, and this house is now mine. Get out. Now, you can imagine, the door would close, possibly a little faster than it opened, but you stick your foot in the door because you have a backup plan. They said, if you don't get out of here, I'll call the police. And you said, if you don't get out of here, I'll call an angel. Because God says, I'll send an angel before you. He'll drive out the Hittite and the Perizzite and the Jebusite. If you don't get it, angel, take care of them. The angel lifts his hand and they, you know, evaporate or something. And you go in and there is the house of your dreams. It is loaded with good things. Now, that's pretty hard to beat in the new covenant, isn't it? You know. I mean, some of the miracles of the Old Testament, we do not see the magnitude of them until we get to the book of Revelation. Imagine applying for a job, and you have your resume there, and the man in front of you, you know, has his resume, and he says, uh, I turn water into wine. It's pretty hard to beat, until the guy behind you says, well, I turn the Nile to blood. The man in front of you says, well, I fed 5,000 people with a little boy's lunch. The man behind you says, well, that's nothing. I fed a million people for 40 years with nothing. Again, the miracles of the Old Testament are amazing, aren't they? Water out of a rock. Oh, we will think of the water coming out of the rock, just a little trickle. No, the Bible says, the psalmist says, it was like the ocean depths. Why? Because you've got a million people at least, and they were farmers, and you know that they possibly had at least 20 or 30 or 40 head of cattle of some sort, sheep, aside from themselves. So let's reduce that down to say just five per family. So now you've got the five million animals and people that need a water supply. That's a, that's a big water supply. That's a water supply sufficient almost to take care of the needs of Ireland. And it all came out of a rock. Amazing, isn't it? And so the news begins to spread. We can go in and possess the land. It's finally arrived. This is the day Moses just had a word from God that we can go into houses and lands and vineyards and olive trees. Wow. 
You see, this was the carrot, if you like, that kept them going all the way through the wilderness was this, if you like, carrot at the end of the stick dangling in front of the children of Israel. When they got discouraged, well, one day we'll have houses and lands and vineyards. The problem was that God drops a bombshell. Notice what he says there. Verse 2, I'll send an angel before you. I'll drive out the Canaanite, the Amorite, the Hittite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, the Jebusite. Go up to a land flowing with milk and honey. And then here is the bombshell. For I will not go in your midst. You're on your own. I'm not going. Why? Because you're stiff-necked, you're stubborn, you're rebellious. And Moses now is faced with a dilemma. He's faced with a major problem. What do I do? He has one of two choices. He can either stay where he is. Let me describe where he is. He's in a waste howling wilderness. When I say a waste, that's why the Bible describes it, a waste howling wilderness. Why? Because there was no vegetation, no natural sustenance. It was just... Uh, sagebrush and sand as far as the eye could see. There was no natural means of uh, life. There was no rain. It was dry. It was incredibly hot during the day. It plummeted at night where you could literally freeze to death. The sun will not smite thee by day, the moon by night. And so God had to come up with a great big mammoth umbrella. There over the tabernacle was a cloud, and that cloud was not just going straight up. That cloud obviously covered the camp because it was so hot during the day that they were under the shelter of that umbrella. At nighttime, it was a pillar of fire. It was a heating system. God was very practical. He took care of his people. So choice A is to stay where you are. A waste howling wilderness. Not exactly what we would call in America the American dream or the Irish dream. Nothing. Oh, the presence of God is there. Now you've got choice B. Choice B, of course, is to go into a land flowing with milk and honey. God does not say, I'm going to change it. I'm going to curse the land because you've been so bad. No, he says there are still houses, there are still lands, vineyards, olive trees what we would call the American dream. The American dream is to have your home, a little bit of property. Again, everything paid for. And yet, you can have all of that, God says, but I'm not going with you. Now, if you had to choose tonight on your way out, if you had to sign, if you like, one of those, will I choose choice A or choice B? Will I choose to stay in a waste howling wilderness with absolutely nothing, no amenities, no pleasures in the natural, but I do have the presence of God? Or would you choose all the blessings of God? And they were from God. It was God's inheritance for the children of Israel. And not only that, but he says, I'll send an angel before you. Oh, it wasn't all material. There was the supernatural. After all, this angel was going to do things that they were incapable of doing, signs, wonders, and miracles. This angel was going to drive out the Hittite and the Perizzite and the Jebusite. This is one of the scariest verses in the Bible, the scariest chapter, that you can have the supernatural activity of God and still not have the presence of God. It wasn't a demon that God said he would send. It was an angel. An angel that was going to do things that they were incapable of doing. They were going to see signs, wonders, miracles. And yet God says, I'm not going. And so Moses now has a choice. What do I do? You see, Moses had an advantage that the children of Israel did not have. We have a saying in America, I'm sure you've heard it, I've been there and done that. Moses had been there and done that. Moses was raised in the home, if you like, uh, the equivalent of Buckingham Palace, the equivalent of the White House. He was a king's kid. After all, Grandpa was... Pharaoh. He was the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He was adopted, you recall, and he was raised in the home of a king, the king of Egypt. He was royalty. He was a king's kid. He had every luxury that you can imagine. And yet the Bible says that even with all those luxuries and all those amenities that he had, possibly the finest clothes, 
most beautiful chariot to go around and he had a finest education. The book of Acts says he was mighty, he was eloquent in word and deed. And yet it says that the day came when Moses chose to suffer affliction with the people of God rather than all the treasures and pleasures of Egypt. In other words, he renounced that. Why? Because there is no house that will substitute for God's presence. There is no gold or silver, there's no wealth of any kind, jewels or whatever, fame or fortune. Moses had all of that. He had all that status because he was a king's kid. And yet he turns his back on it. And so now he's faced with houses and lands or the presence of God. He gave up houses and lands to choose the presence of God. So like I say, he's been there and done that. And so he begins to pray. Verse 13. Sorry. We go to um, verse, verse 13 of chapter 33. Now therefore I pray thee, if I have found grace in thy sight, let me know thy ways, that I may know thee that I may find grace in thy sight and consider that this nation is thy people. Now, this is a strange prayer. I think at least it's a strange prayer given the circumstances. Moses is praying and he says, God, give me grace, but most of all, that I may know thee. That's, that's the cry of this man, that I may know thee, like Paul. Now, let's be honest, if I was in this predicament, and I was Moses, my prayer would have been something like this, hey God, let's talk. I'm going to take you up on your offer. God says, what offer? Oh, remember when you said, come, let us reason together? Oh yeah, I remember. Okay, let's reason together, man to man, face to face. God, I know you're, you, you were angry yesterday. And when we get angry, sometimes we say things we regret later, and boy, you talked about wiping us out off the face of the earth and so on, but you know, now that you've had a good night's rest sort of thing, let's talk. You know, there's a part of me, God, that loves houses and lands and vineyards. I'm natural. I like things. But there's another part of me that loves spiritual things, and I want to know you. And so, God, why, 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 why can't we have some sort of agreement here that we can have a little bit of both? You don't have to hang, us out, or hang around us all the time. I know we sort of get on your nerves, you know, body language, I can still tell. But there's a part of me that wants your presence. And there's a part of me that would love one of those big houses and lands and vineyards. And so let's have some... No, Moses does not mention houses, lands, vineyards. All he says is, God, I want to know you. I want to know you. It wasn't about houses and lands. That wasn't what was going to satisfy this man. He wanted the presence of God. And he cries out for God's presence. And God says to him in verse 14, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. In other words, I think if we were to fill in the blanks here, God is saying to himself, if you hunger and thirst that much, how can I refuse you? Moses, if you are that desperate for my presence, how can I possibly deny you my presence will go with you. And Moses has already made up his mind because he says, if your presence does not go with me, do not lead us up from here. Do not take us up hence. In other words, God, if I can't convince you to go, I'd rather stay. I'd rather stay. I'd rather lose the houses and lands, the vineyards. I'd rather dwell in this parched, dry, barren, arid land with nothing but sand as far as the eye can see, where there's no vegetation, where there are no cities. There is nothing. A number of years ago, about 20 years ago now, I guess, maybe almost anyway, I was down in the Canary Islands ministering I was in Spain and they flew me down to do a weekend of meetings and the couple that I was staying with, the missionaries, were telling me that there are times when the sands are so, or the winds I should say, are so powerful on the continent of Africa, the Sahara, that the wind will stir up the sand and it will carry it all the way out to the Canary Islands, somewhere 150, whatever it is, 200 miles off the coast of Africa. 
And she said, you can clean one day, but if those winds come, it just seems to penetrate and infiltrate, get under the doors. And she said, that sand seems to get everywhere. And she said, it's miserable. Imagine being in the very epicenter, if you like, a waste howling wilderness where all it is, it's just swirling sand, dry, barren. And yet this man says, I would rather live in that sort of, those sort of conditions and have your presence than the finest houses and lands and vineyards and olive trees. Wow. That's something. And then he says this, verse 16, For wherein shall it be known here that I and thy people have found grace in thy sight? Is it not that thou shouldest go with us so that we may be, my translation that I use is, so that we may be distinguished? The King James says, so that we may be separated from all the people who are on the face of the earth. In other words, what Moses is saying here, God, there is only one thing that makes us unique, and it's your presence. That's the only thing that distinguishes us. That's the only thing that separates us from all the other nations. It isn't the fact that we have a temple, as good as it is. It isn't the fact that we have Ten Commandments. It isn't the fact that we have our long sideburns and our kosher diet and our dress and, you know, our celebratory days and feasts and so on. Those may be good, but the one thing that makes us unique and different than all the other nations, because the other nations have got their gods, the other nations have got those gods, have got their temples. Those temples have got their order of service. Those temples have got their sacrifices. They've got their rules and regulations and so on, just like anybody else. But the thing that makes us unique is your presence. It's the only thing, Moses says, that separates us from all the nations on the face of the earth. And let me suggest to you, it's the only thing that makes you and I distinct. Oh, it doesn't matter where you, whether you wear a hat or dress down to your feet, really isn't what it's all about. It's the presence of God. It's the presence of God. And if God's presence is not with you, you're no different than the Mormon church or any other church. You have a form of godliness, but there's no presence, no power. Moses, Lord, this is the only thing that separates us. It's the only thing that makes us unique. Only thing that marks us out from all the other religions is the fact that your presence is in our midst. And if your presence doesn't go with us, we're going to stay. And so here we have a man crying out again for the presence of God, this deep, deep longing that he has for God's presence. Turn with me, if you will, to Song of Solomon for a moment. You see, it's one thing to know what it is to cry out for God's presence, but like any relationship, you need to know that the other person is just as interested in you. Isn't that right? It's pretty weird pretty much impossible to have a relationship with somebody if they're not interested in having a relationship with you. You can do everything you can to get their attention and lavish them with gifts and so on, but if they just want to walk away and they turn their back, you're never going to have a relationship with them. And so we've got a man with a longing for a relationship with God. But Song of Solomon, we have this very beautiful little book where you have the bride and the bridegroom. They fall in love. The the book begins really in Apart from the introduction there, verse 1, verse 2, where she says, kiss me with the kisses of your mouth. Your love is better than wine. In other words, she is madly in love with him. And she said, listen, all I want is to be embraced by you, kissed by you. I found that that stimulates and exhilarates and satisfies more than wine. Wine, of course, for most people is a coping mechanism. When you get bad news, people hit the bottle, if you like, and alleviate their pain for a little while, wake up with a hangover, but uh, nevertheless, you know, the wine satisfies for a period of time. But she says, listen, I found something that is greater than anything the world has to offer. It's better than the finest wine. It exhilarates and stimulates and satisfies more than anything else. And it's simply to be kissed by you, to be in your presence, to be embraced by you. And so begins this wonderful relationship. And if you know the story, they skip over the hills together. They do all sorts of things together. And then we come to chapter 5. And in chapter 5, there's a little bit of a setback in their relationship. We don't know all the details, but 
Beginning in verse 2, she says, I was asleep, but my heart was awake. She says, a voice, my beloved, was knocking, saying, open to me, my sister, my love, my dove, my undefiled, for my head is filled with dew and my locks with the drops of the night. So he arrives at her house, and he begins knocking on the door, and he is shouting out to her, trying to get her attention, open to me, my darling, my dove, my perfect one. He wants to come in. He wants to have fellowship. That's the cry and the longing on the heart of God. Here we have God pursuing us. God has chosen you. He's chosen me as great a mystery as it may be. He's chosen us to be His bride. And He is madly in love with us, madly committed to us. He loves us with an everlasting love. He demonstrated that love by hanging on our cross, taking your sin and my sin, And he's saying, open to me, my dove, my darling, my perfect one. I want to come in. I want to have fellowship. I want a relationship with you. Now, it's a night scene because he said, my head is filled with dew, my locks with the drops of the night. And so this has taken place at night. It's in the city of Jerusalem. And she can hear him knocking. Some people say this was a dream. Other people say that it was uh, real. We don't know. She said, I was asleep, but my heart was awake. Whether she was uh, in a literal sleep, and the way I can uh, describe it, those of you who have got little ones at home, you know that you always are awake to a degree. You hear that little whimper next door, the baby crying, and so on. Maybe she was like that. She was just going into a, a sleep, but she was still sort of attentive enough to hear the knocking. And now she has a decision to make. What do I do? And verse 3, she says, I've put off my coat. My translation says, I've taken off my dress. How can I put it on again? I've washed my feet. How can I defile them again or dirty them again? In other words, uh, she hears him knocking, and she's already gone to bed. She's already taken off her dress. She's already got ready for bed. She's in bed. And she thinks to herself, this is not a good time. If I respond to him, I'm going to have to get up. And if I get up, I'm going to have to put on my dress again. And uh, after he leaves, I'm going to have to get ready for bed again and wash my feet again. And I've just done all of that. And this is not a convenient time. And so she hesitates. Now, I don't think that she said that out loud When he's saying, open to me, my darling, my dove, I don't think she says, listen, I've taken off my dress. I don't want to put it on again. I think this is going on in her mind. She's contemplating, do I get up or don't I? Do I respond or don't I? Verse 4, my beloved put his hand by the hole of the door and my bowels will move for him. He's trying to get in. He's trying to see her. Now, one of the things we don't know about this portion of Scripture, or for that matter, many passages of Scripture, we don't have the time element. I wish we did. I wish we had a little digital clock that was playing on the side as to how many minutes go by. You see, she may be the sort of gal that, you know, it takes her a while to get ready. Oh, it's not just a matter of putting on her dress. She has to have her hair perfect and everything else perfect, and that could take 10 minutes, 15 20 back there, 25, 30. (laughs) Isn't that right? And so he's patient. He knows she's in there. Oh, how he knew, I don't know. Maybe she had a donkey with a white patch on the rump or something, you know, as we would identify somebody's car or bicycle or whatever, you know, that's, oh, that's her, she's home, you know, that's her donkey or that's her camel or whatever, you know. Maybe he's got a secret knock and she knows it's him. And so the time goes by, verse 5, I arose to open to my beloved, my hands drip with myrrh, my fingers with liquid myrrh or with the sweet-smelling myrrh upon the handles of the lock. I opened to my beloved, but my beloved had withdrawn himself and had gone. I opened to my beloved. My translation says, I opened to my beloved, but my beloved had turned and had gone. When she finally opens the door, he's not there. You see, he's been grieved, he's been wounded, he's been hurt. The person that is capable of loving you the most is capable of giving you the most pain. Isn't that right? I couldn't care less what the neighbors think. 
But when somebody loves me, or at least I think they love me, says something with a little bit of an edge, boy, it just goes in deep, doesn't it? This is her beloved. Oh, this is uh, his beloved, I should say. And he's made his intentions known. My darling, my dove, my perfect one, open. I want to be with you. And she hesitates. She doesn't respond. And you know, when you don't have information, you sort of manufacture it, don't you? Oh, maybe he's been on a business trip. Maybe the last thing she said, maybe four or five days ago was, listen, darling, when you get back, I don't care if it's day or night, make sure you come around to my house and let me know you're home safely. Maybe they kissed goodnight. There was no emails in those days. There's no telephones. And she says, whatever you do, when you get back from that trip, come and see me. So maybe he comes after a week of being away or two weeks of being away, maybe you know, a traitor of some sort, I don't know. And so by the time he gets back again, it's late at night, but he keeps his promise and he comes to let her know, I'm, ho I'm home, darling, I'm here, open. And she doesn't respond and he begins to think, uh-huh, maybe an old boyfriend showed up. Maybe there's something else going on. You know how when we don't have the information, we make it up, don't we? And after waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting, he finally turns, and he's gone. But the thing I love about this portion of Scripture is she doesn't go back to bed. She realizes, I've blown it, I've missed it, I've made a horrible mistake, I've lost the person that I love the most, and I've got to restore, no matter how long it takes me, I've got to restore this broken relationship. And even though it's the middle of the night, she gets up and she gets dressed and she puts her shawl on, and it says there, I sought him, verse 6, but I could not find him. I called, but he gave me no answer. The watchmen that make the rounds of the city found me. They smote me. They wounded me. The keepers of the wall took away my veil from me or my shawl. Now it's really costing her. Now she's suffering. Now she's been beaten up. She's wounded. Maybe got a black eye, bloody nose. I don't know. But she's been beat up, wounded. And yet she keeps on. Her shawl, her covering has been removed. And as she makes her way through the city of Jerusalem, thinking maybe to herself, I'm all alone, here it is, one o'clock in the morning or two o'clock in the morning. And she comes across the daughters of Jerusalem, verse 8, I charge you. In other words, I ask you, O daughters of Jerusalem, if you see my beloved or if you find my beloved, tell him that I'm sick of, uh, of love. In other words, I'm lovesick. Tell him I'm, I'm brokenhearted. If you see my beloved, tell him, please convey to him that I'm desperate, I've got to find him, I've got to restore my broken relationship. And so she solicits the help of these young women as they're maybe coming home for the night. And they look at her, and they say there in verse 9, What is thy beloved more than another beloved? O thou fairest among women, what is thy beloved more than another beloved that thou should be, thou should, uh, thou dost uh, charge us? My translation says, you know, basically, what's so special about your boyfriend? Not quite like that, but that's what they're saying. In other words, what's so special about this guy? Why are you charging us? Why are you asking us? I mean, what, what, why is he so different than anybody else? Now, can you imagine if you can picture the scene? He's out there, or was a few minutes ago. He said, my head is drenched with the dew of the night, so there's a light rain falling. It's a night scene. This is Jerusalem. There's no big neon signs. Maybe the moon just uh, filtering through the, the rays of, uh, of the, uh, the rain. Maybe an odd oil lamp or something. And they look at this woman and she's wounded. Again, maybe a black eye. She's lost her shawl. She's a little disheveled. Obviously very emotional. And they look at her and they say, what's so special about your boyfriend? And they're thinking, at least what I would think if I saw that sort of scene, here is a girl all sort of roughed up and bruised and broken a little bit, wounded. Another case of domestic violence. This young girl, beautiful though she is, she's in love with some man that is an alcoholic, druggy. They've had a fight. He's taken off, and she's codependent. She can't give him up. And so they say, listen, you're gorgeous. You're beautiful. You're the most beautiful woman we've ever seen. 
That's what they're really saying to him. You are gorgeous. What is so special about this man? And all of a sudden, she begins to open up. And she begins to describe him, and she says, My beloved is white and ruddy, the chiefest among 10,000. She says, Listen, if you had 10,000 men from Jerusalem, all eligible bachelors, my beloved would be the most outstanding one. He would eclipse all the others. He's amazing. He's the fairest of 10,000. His head is like the most fine gold. His locks are bushy and black as a raven. His eyes are like the eyes of doves. She goes on, his cheeks are like beds of spices. His hands are like rods of gold. His legs are like pillars of marble, and so on. Now notice what she's doing. She's not describing his assets. She's describing him. She's not saying, listen, have you ever heard of Donald Trump? Have you ever heard of Bill Gates? Have you ever heard of Steve Jobs? Oh, my beloved would make those guys look like paupers. My beloved owns the cattle on a thousand hills. My beloved is so rich, he's got, you know, banks and uh, he's got wealth galore. You know that beautiful mansion on the outside of town that's being built? When we get married, that's going to be where I'm going to live. I'll never have to worry again. He's going to provide me with all the beautiful silks and linens and diamonds and sapphire. No. She's not talking about his assets. She's not talking about his wealth. She's talking about him. Let me describe him to you. He's got the most beautiful eyes. He's got the most beautiful hands. He's got the most gorgeous hair. You see, she knows him, and she can describe him in detail, but she's lost him. She's lost him. And she sums it all up there in verse 16. His mouth is most sweet. He is altogether lovely. There's not one single thing she can say negative about him. He's altogether lovely. In other words, he's faultless, he's perfect. And she said, this is my beloved, and this is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. This is my friend. Oh, I can imagine if she elaborated any more, she could have said, you know, when we first started going together, I didn't know how to treat him. You see, I'm just a poor old peasant girl, and he's a king. Not only a king, but he's the king of all kings. He's the lord of all lords. And I was all sort of awkward. I didn't quite know how to relate, but he said to me one day, and it changed everything, no longer do I call you a servant but I call you my friend. And she said, something changed in our relationship, and he's become my very, very, very best friend. But I've lost my friend. Notice their response, if you will, chapter 6 and verse 1. Of course, there's no chapter divisions in the original. Whither is thou, beloved, gone? Or where is your beloved gone? O thou fairest among women, whither is thy beloved turned, that we may seek him with you? Do you mind if we tag along? That's their response. Do you mind if we seek him with you? Oh, something's changed. They begin, hey, what's so special about this guy? And by the time she gets through describing him, they want to meet him. And they said, listen, can we join you? Would you be good enough to introduce your friend? Do you think your friend could be my friend? You know, that's really the place God wants to bring the church to. Where we are so madly in love with Him. Where when we begin to talk about Him, our countenance changes, where we we can't get enough of Him, so to speak. And the world says, listen, you've got something that I want. Can I tag along? What church do you go to? What fellowship do you go to? You've got something. I don't know what it is, but I want what you've got. That's the way it's supposed to be, isn't it? A love relationship. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all your soul, all your strength, all your mind. Now you see, this story is repeated in the New Testament. You find almost the identical story in the book of Revelation, chapter 3. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Open to me, my darling, my dove, my perfect one. I want to come in. I want to sup with you. No, we don't need you. We're rich. We're increased with goods. We've got a beautiful building now. Pastors on television. 
you know, we try that church down the road, we, we don't really need you anymore. I mean, that was the Laodicean church. Rich and increased with goods and need of nothing, not even you, Lord. Open to me. Open to me. You see, the story here in Song of Solomon and the problem with this girl was this. She was clean, but she was comfortable. She was clean, but she was comfortable. I've taken off my dress and I've washed my feet. Jesus said, if I wash your feet, all of you is clean. The problem was, and there's nothing wrong with being clean, but she was comfortable. Not now, Lord. I don't want to go any further. I'm comfortable just the way I am. Come back some other time when it's more convenient. I, you know, I'm lying down in bed. I don't want to get up. The Bible says, warn to those that are at ease in where? Zion. Zion, the very place where God's presence is supposed to be. And they've gone to sleep. They've settled down. They've become complacent, indifferent. And you know, that's the problem, I think, with the church worldwide. We've lost our passion. We've lost our first love. Oh, we know we can describe Him in detail. We've got all our doctrines down pat. But is that burning love, that intense longing for His presence? Do we hunger and thirst after Him? That's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. And maybe some of you, you have to be honest tonight. And you have to say, listen, I don't have that passion. I used to have it. There was a time when I had a fervor for God, a passion for prayer. I used to love to read the Word of God. I couldn't wait to get to the house of God. I used to tell everybody about Him. But you know, over the years, well, I've settled down. Oh, I'm clean. I've kept myself clean by the grace of God. But I no longer have that burning, longing desire for Him. And I believe tonight He's saying, open to me. My darling, my dove, that's where revival begins. It really is. It's finding again your first love. Letting God awaken your heart. And put in you that longing, that desire for His presence. And it's the only thing that separates us. The only thing. Moses said, if your presence doesn't go with us, carry us not up hence. Let's close in prayer. <clears throat> Father, you know the condition of our lives. Father, you know whether we have a longing or whether we've settled down and, Lord, become somewhat cold in our relationship. Lord, we've left again our first love. Other things have come in, like Demas, who loved the present world, gave up again the ministry because the world had such an allurement. Father, whatever it is tonight, awaken us. We thank you, Lord, again. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses from all sin. And all we have to do is avail ourselves and say, Lord, forgive me, cleanse me. Lord, renew a right spirit within me. Lord, put within me once again that intense longing for your presence. Father, I don't want to be satisfied with anything else. Lord, the world has absolutely nothing that can replace you. There is no replacement for the living God. Father, open our eyes, open our understanding. Fill us again with your love, Lord. Let the love of God be shed abroad in our hearts. Change our lives, Lord. Restore us back. Lord, do that work of revival. Lord, revive us again. Oh, God, breathe into us, Lord, even as we revive a body in the natural that's been drowning, that, Lord, we would breathe into them and bring that body back to life. Bring them out of their unconscious state. Father, we ask spiritually, Lord, bring us out of our unconscious state. Make us God-conscious. Breathe into us, Lord, the very breath of life. Spirit of the living God, do that which only you can do. Father, we come before you humbly tonight, openly, Lord, confessing our need of you. Lord, we don't want to go on the way we are. 
Lord, your word says to them that look for him, he will appear. Father, we believe that while there is a final finality to that one day, where we're going to see you face to face, Lord, we believe also to those that look to you, you will appear. Lord, even now, even tonight, Lord, we can look and see you. Lord, if we truly seek you with all of our heart, Father, we ask, Lord, touch lives tonight. Lord, you who are the great shepherd. Lord, you who love us with an everlasting love. Oh, God, don't turn away tonight. Father, I pray that, Lord, your people would respond. They won't put it off. They won't say, I'm, well, I've got to put on my dress. I've got to do this. I've got to do that. Lord, all the excuses, Lord, take them away tonight. Bring us to that place, Lord, where all we want is you. Let's just take a moment. You voice again that prayer to God, whether it's audibly or whether it's just silently. God knows again your heart. He knows the relationship that you have. If you need to say, breathe on me, breath of God. Fill me with life anew. God, do it. Just let him hear that cry. Hosea says, when you return to the Lord, take with you words. In other words, don't just sit there as though some sort of spiritual osmosis is going to do anything. Take with you words. Say, Lord, you know that's me. Lord, that's my heart tonight. Lord, I've drifted. I've wandered. Lord, I'm not involved in any great sin. Or, but Lord, I, I am cold. I become complacent. Lord, your word no longer holds an interest to me. Father, renew again, restore the years, the months, the days that the locusts and the cankerworm have taken from me. Lord, bring it back. Father, fill me again with that, just that longing for your presence, God. I know sometimes it feels uncomfortable during the times of silence, but I believe it's those times of silence where we can reconnect with God. Avail yourself at that time. Father, we thank you. Thank you, Lord, for your great, great patience with each and every one of us. And yet, Lord, you said my spirit will not always strive, 
with men. And so, Lord, we don't want to take for granted that, Lord, you'll be here tomorrow and the next day just waiting. Father, you didn't wait. You eventually left to draw her out to see how desperate she really was. And thank God she went after you and pursued you. But, Lord, we can open the door tonight. We thank you, Lord, for the work that you've done. Father, let it increase. Let us go from faith to faith, from victory to victory, increasing and abounding, not in just our knowledge of God, but in our love for God. Lord, do a deeper, deeper work in us, we pray. In Jesus' name.